Good evening. Welcome to Metro Vision Studios. My name is Reese Kiana. Thank you so much for tuning in to our midweek service tonight. Uh, I am looking forward to just diving into our series again. We're continuing the series called One Another Relationships, God's Way. That the great thing about being a disciple, a Christian, is we get to be in a community of believers that get to practice one another relationships, that we can encourage each other, inspire each other. And these are some of the lessons that uh, we've done so far this year in our midweeks, we learn to care for one another. Have you been doing that? Have you been in your small groups, in your discipling times, in your, in your uh, times of uh, working with one another? Are you expressing care for one another? Are you spurring one another on toward loving good deeds? Are you encouraging one another? Last week we talked, uh, last week we talked about encouraging one another. And tonight I'm super encouraged to teach tonight because we're going to be talking about a subject that I think perhaps we all need right now in the midst of all that's going on in our world is learning to honor one another. And I want you to think of that thought for a minute, what it means to honor one another. And as we go into our Bible study, let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We pray for our Bible study that it would shape our minds, shape our hearts, shape the way we think. Uh, that could it could form Christ within our hearts so that we can extend this kind of honor toward others uh, to, to be, feel honored ourselves, but also to extend toward one another. God, we love you. Bless our Bible study today. Thank you so much for uh, all the things that are happening in our church right now, that new ways, we're doing new things, new ways of doing things even uh, because of some of the challenges we're facing. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, guys, there's a rise in everything in our world right now. Rise in mental health challenges, rise. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling it, you know. I talked about last week, I'm an extrovert and I feel like I need to get different kinds of fellowship and make the calls and I'm a bit Zoom fatigued, so that's a bit rough for me sometimes. I'll, I'll do it, but man, I'm, I'm yearning for connection. And, and, you know, I was watching the news the other day and there is a rise in mental health. And so we want to encourage all of our families right now to pay attention to what's going on with our kids, with each other, with those in our groups, uh, because, because it is tough. You know, it's, what's hard about COVID-19 is not knowing when it's going to end. Like if we knew there was an end in sight, we could gear up for it and get ready for it, but we don't. And, 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 you know, there's a rise in cases right now all over the United States. My graduation that was supposed to happen from my grad school has been postponed. I'm, I'm not traveling in December, which is kind of good, you know, but it'll be in, in May of 2021. But there's a lot of things that are changing right now. And so, you know, if you feel like you need some help and some encouragement even more tonight, we, we uh, I hope this lesson will encourage us. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, in verse 9 to 13, the Bible says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Let me say that again. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality, which is a little difficult right now, right? Practicing hospitality because we can't really have people in our homes. Please, let's practice the three W's, right? Uh, and, and, and do a really good job as, as we are living in a new era right now of COVID-19. So, you know, but what I love about this passage is that Paul is talking about be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the context of this during the Roman Empire. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been sharing a lot about the Roman Empire because this is the context in which the disciples lived in. And, and it gives us insight into how they learned to work with each other and the kind of encouragement that was needed for every Christian to do well and, and that we need encouragement. And there's nothing wrong with you if you're like, I need encouragement right now. Uh, let's give encouragement. Let's honor one another. You know, th there's a contrast, though, toward honoring one another. The Pharisees, completely other, uh, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, where they're the ones always wanting, always looking to get honor, always, always think they deserve honor. In, in Matthew 23, in verse 5 to 7, the message, it says, And they do all their deeds to be noticed by other people. 
if you're a person that loves to be noticed, if you're a love, person that loves the attention, chances are you're probably going to be end up like a Pharisee. For they brought in their phylacteries and lengthened their tassels on their garments. And they love the place of honor at banquets and the seats of honor in synagogues and personal greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by the people. Pharisees love to be recognized, love honor, love. Like if they're at a function, they're going to they're going to immediately take the place of honor because they think they deserve that. And so you see a contrast with Paul telling the disciples, be devoted to one another and learn to honor one another above yourself. Put yourself, be, play, learn to play second fiddle, if you will. Uh, but then you see the contrast where Jesus talking to the Pharisees and giving a scathing rebuke to them. You know, just a, just a, just a strong teaching against the Pharisees. You know, right now I'm in a, I'm in one of my classes about the prophets, about the minor prophets and pro prophetic critique and a vision for renewal that prophets hit the scene when, when leadership went astray in, in Israel and Judah and, and the prophets would speak up against, uh, people who were abusing their power and exploiting the poor and, and in just social injustices going on, you know, and, and the prophets would hit the scene and Jesus was like that. He totally came on the scene and, and, and challenged those who love the place of honor. And there's another guy in third John, Diotrephes. I wrote to the church by Diotrephes, who loves to be first. If you're a competitive person, we have to watch out. I love, I'm a competitive person. And so I need to watch out so that I don't, uh, I don't love the place of honor, seek attention and all that. Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and he puts them out of the church. Diotrephes was a bad dude. Well, why was he bad? Because he, he loved attention, so he couldn't honor others. Those who love attention or have the, uh, sometimes just, just want the attention, they can't honor others. And part of being a disciple that Paul was teaching the church in Rome of all places was to honor one another in the midst of the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire, empire represented the powerful, the, those in charge, those who have privileges, benefits. And, and marginalized the poor, the weak, the, the uh, women, children. They were just marginalized and kicked to the curb, you know? And so we're going to talk about three things tonight. Why do we honor others? Who do we honor? When do we honor? And for the first one, why do we honor others? I love this passage. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that m move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. One, one of the reasons why we honor one another and others is because God honors us. Look at this, he puts the imago Dei. The word for image is this Latin word imago Dei. So when, when, when God created mankind he created us with this inherent sense and uh, of worth, value and worth God honors us by giving us that value freely he honors us this is where our worth actually comes from it's not from people it's not from our role it's not from what we do our value and our worth as human beings come from God come from the imago Dei that God created us in his likeness we're more like God than we are different amongst each other I mean, what a powerful thought. I mean, this passage alone destroys racism. It just destroys it. Why? Because every human being, male and female, are made with the Imago Dei. Is that we have value and worth because God gives us that value in the worth. We don't get it from somewhere else. God gives it freely. And so part of us learning to honor one another is we can honor each other and give it freely. We, they, nobody has to earn it from us because we can give it freely because it has been given freely to us. We didn't earn this. Look in, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 and 33, Jesus honors us. 
Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Look at that. I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. This is a scene, you know, uh, of Jesus giving us an image. And I love that about the Bible, that the Bible gives us images that help us visually understand. So imagine this scene for a minute that, that we're in heaven and, and, and a person who has passed away goes. So I use this passage at John Lagarde's uh, memorial service painting this picture that in heaven, you imagine all people of faith around and, and God is in the, in the middle of this arena. And there's a throne and, and there's a red carpet that goes up to that throne. And imagine a, a, a Christian walking his way up there, you know, to the throne. And then Jesus gets up and acknowledges that person. This is John Lagarde Sr. before all the people of faith and being honored because he acknowledged Jesus as Lord of his life. And what a powerful thought that is. God honors us. Jesus honors us. And so who can we honor? Who do we honor in our lives? Who can we honor in our small group? Who can we honor? Remember, honor can be, can be given freely. Nobody has to earn it. We can actually just give it because we see the Imago Dei in somebody else, you know, we see that they have value. And so we honor that, that God gave them value. So we treat them with respect and honor and courage and, and freely give it. And I love that, you know, in this book, uh, The Rise of Christianity uh, by Rodney Starks. Did you know that the early church was the only place in all of the Roman Empire to honor people? The early church was the only place where all people were honored of all different classes, statuses, you name it. And, and as much as we don't like to talk about status, class, and all that, it's here. It existed back in the first century. It exists in the 21st century. We see it all the time. In the Roman Empire, here's the social hierarchy during the Roman Empire time. And look at the bot. Look at the top. The emperors at the top, patrician centers, equestrians, plebeians, soldiers, free. Look where women, slaves, even gladiators were at the bottom. So if you love that movie Gladiator, it, it, I don't think we understand. They were at the bottom of the, the scale here. You know, they're at the bottom. And those who were, those who were women, slaves, freemen, like that, they were all just pushed to the margins, all pushed to the sides. And, and the Roman Empire did not value. They, 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 they represented empire, strength, power. You know, those in charge and, and those who were marginalized were always pushed to the side, the poor. The women, children, slaves, gladiators, just forgotten. And in the kingdom of God, that is upside down. Those who are pushed to the margins are the ones that are most honored. In fact, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26 to 27. It says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Like, like if, when you see the poor or, or those who are marginalized in our society, in the kingdom of God, Paul this is an amazing teaching that is sometimes not even noticed in, 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 in 21st century Christianity. But they're treated with special honor. They're not just given honor. They're given special honor. And, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. What I love about this passage is that the paradigm is turned upside down about the kingdom of God. In the world, the powerful, the rich, those who, who are in positions of authority, have tremendous, who have tremendous power, in the kingdom of God, it is switched. God is at the top. You know what I mean? And, and, and the poor... The marginalized, those who are left out at outcasts of society that nobody thinks about, they're treated with special honor. You know, in my third semester of school, I went to this place over here. And these are three of my professors over here. Uh, I'm in the middle with David Molina. Uh, to, my, to, to the left of the picture is Dr. Love. He's the, he's the uh, director of the prog uh, program that I'm in. And there, there's this, this author, a book that I was reading. His name is Richard Beck. And then David Molina, there's a, another uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Naomi Walters, 
Uh, she did a class on leadership as hospitality. And then there's a, one of the ladies in our cohort, the only lady in, in the cohort that I'm in, Jill Wiwobo, who's in the Antelope Valley Church. And we went to this church because part of the training that I get is by going into other environments, going into other churches and being able to learn, to learn what God is doing in different situations and different environments. And one of the reasons why we go to this church in the program, every cohort comes to this church in Durham, North Carolina, because one of the, the, the ways that uh, we've been working and ch- getting trained on about what worship is, like what is worship really? Is worship just where we just come and hear songs and we, we're in church services together? Obviously now we're, we're at home doing it virtually, but uh, when we were meeting together, what does a worship serve? What is it supposed to look like and, and what is it supposed to say? And one of the things we learned through history is that worship is about the, the, the public display of God's reconciling power. And so one of the reasons why a lot of our professors go to this church in Citywell right here, and we, may, we differ in our doctrine and all that, all that put aside, right, is we go there because we are put in a situation where per, we, we see some things that perhaps we normally wouldn't see. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a woman who was leading our, our one of the sessions there where we were. there was a lesson that was done and, and it, she came up and she stuttered. And as she stuttered, you know, normally you wouldn't probably see that in a worship service. But because worship is the public display of God's reconciling power in the world, to see somebody who perhaps would never be put up there and is put before everybody and, and in weakness and whatever it is, whatever how people view it as. God doesn't look at that perhaps as weakness. Perhaps we do. But in, in this context that I was in, we got to see people in front of the service that, that had, you know, she stuttered. And it was powerful. I was crying the whole time because I could see God's reconciling power that you know, that, that those perhaps who may feel that they're pushed to the margin and not even noticed are treated with special honor in God's church. And I thought, wow, that, that was so moving and powerful for me, you know, to see that. Even Dr. Love, one of the reasons why he goes here, he has, he has six degrees, I believe. Like, you know how like, and I feel just dumb being around him. I walk up, say, hey, Dr. Love, I feel dumb all of a sudden. You know, just, he doesn't treat me like that, but I feel like that. The dude has so many degrees and a lot of guys who are who are very educated and in the academic sphere uh, go to churches like this because they they they're not treated with a special honor there. They're just treated like one of the guys, which makes them feel like, wow, that that that's what we should be feeling at church, that there's no hierarchy when we come to church and that the public display of, of God's reconciling power can be seen. And, and, and seen publicly where we see it, you know, and, and I was very moved by that. Uh, I love that experience. Well, who do we, who can, who do we honor though? In Leviticus 19, verse 32, it says, you shall stand up in the presence of the gray headed and honor elders, honor those who are older than you. And you shall feel your, fear your God. I am the Lord. Who do we honor? Those older older than us. Anybody older than us, we can give honor freely. Why? Because they're older than us. And the Bible calls us to, you know, like in my family, when, when you're with my Hawaiian side of my family, when my grandma, grandfather and grandmother walks in the room on my dad's side, everybody pays attention. They automatically give honor. You know, they automatically give. If there's food over there, they sit down, all the kids, we all get up and we all give honor. It, it, it would be it would be a major, like people would look at you and think you're out of your mind if you're a child and you went to go eat first when elders are in the room. It would just, you know, in my family, some, but anyway, I don't even want to talk about it, but you know what I mean. Something would be happening uh, in that setting there for sure. If a child or, or somebody older uh, is getting their food first when you have elders in the room, somebody who's older than you in the room because they have paid their dues and, earn, and have earned that respect. Uh, but those older, we, we give honor to. And remember, honor doesn't have, you don't, they don't have to do something in order to get honor. The same way we don't have to do something, God gives that honor to us uh, freely. In Exodus 20, one of the Ten Commandments, it's commanded. I mean, it's that important to God. When's the last time you honored your mother and father? 
Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's amazing. Huh? Honor your fa father and mother so that you may live long in the land. <laughs> wow. Another thing, it's, a, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's huge. In the Talmud, you know, honoring one's parents was almost like a direct reflection of that person's honor of God. It, it was directly correlated that in the Talmud, you know, so that you could see, wow, that guy really honors God. How do you, how do you know? It's because of how he treats his parents. You know, he, he's patient, he's kind, he's generous. He, he treats them with extreme respect and devotion that, that showed their honor of God. It was physically present, you know. In Romans chapter 13, everyone must submit to the governing authorities. Let me say that again. Everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. Don't, don't, don't throw anything at me, gang. This is Bible we're talking about. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too. For these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Gang, one of the challenging things, it's a challenging scripture in today, is that, you know, with, with, the, with, with our elections that have gone on and that the Bible would say, give honor to those in governing authorities. Give honor. They don't have to honor you. They don't have to, what do you call it? They don't have to do something for us to give that honor. You can, you can give honor because God has freely given it to us. You don't have to agree. You don't have to agree at all. You, you can have strong convictions about disagreeing about some of the policies and platforms and some of the uh, rhetoric that is going on like that. But, but the Bible, Paul calls the church in Rome to submit to their governing authorities. And I go, what a great what, it just shows how, our kind of understanding of God that we have if we understand these things and we learn to submit appropriately where, where we need to. You know, again, I'm not saying you have to believe in, in everything that a candidate says or doesn't say or anything like that. What I am saying, though, is if we understand God, we understand the Imago Dei, that God has given us honor when we don't deserve it, we can give it freely to those who don't deserve it as well. Powerful, powerful teaching. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, it says, The elders who perform their leadership duties well to be considered worthy of double honor, or not just honor, but financial support, double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word of God concerning eternal salvation through Christ. Let me show you a picture for a second. Let's give some honor to Doug and Joanne Weber, who are our who serve as elders in our congregation for over the last 20 years in Metro LA. Amen. Let's give them some honor. They may not, you know, this is a picture I got of them when they were in their thirties in Boston, in Boston, in the Boston church of Christ, you know, the legendary Cameron Weber wasn't even born yet. Okay. <laughs> but this is a picture I found of Doug and Joanne and I wanted to encourage them today. And this is what, this is what they look like in their thirties. Amen. Let's give them honor, uh, freely. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 to 13, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. Those who they work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance, show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Leaders are to be honored in God's kingdom as well. Paul talks about to the Thessalonian church. And I want to honor the Carrillo family. This is their family right now. You know, and uh, this is probably, I don't even know when this was, but amen. You know, let, let's give honor to our leaders as well. I appreciate my wife, you know, I give her honor and, and let's give honor to the leadership. Uh, why? Because it is something that God calls us to do. We, he gives it freely to us. We can give it freely to those who, who lead us. 
In Romans 10, verse 12, show family affection to one another in brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. If, you lo- if you're a competitive person, go for it. In this passage, outdo one another in, in showing honor. It's like, it's like, you know, like when you, when you go out with a friend and, and you, you, you have a meal and the check comes and you're trying to, I'll pay for it. No, 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 I got it, bro. I got, I got, you know, you do that thing going back and forth. Who, who's trying to get the check, right? We'll do it like this, you know, show honor. Be the first to, be the first to want to show honor uh, to other Christians. I want to give honor here to a sister, Latrice McLaughlin. She is at 12 o'clock today uh, being honored as a woman of influence in the tor- from the Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce. She is, be- she is getting the Community Catalyst Award uh, from the place that she works at, the Connecta Federal Credit Union. And she is being honored amongst four other women in their community of just making a great difference and being a person of influence. And I want to I want to honor her and give her some encouragement, man, just for a great job, you know. And there's others who are who are excelling in their jobs. But this came up. This was sent to me. And I just wanted to make sure that and she got some honor. Look at look. Who else do we honor? This is challenging, gang. Look at this passage in First Peter two. Peter goes, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. I mean, that's just next level discipleship, next level spirituality, next level type of thinking. It shows they have an amazing understanding of God to be able to honor people perhaps that don't deserve it or have treated them poorly. But because of God and they understand their relation to God and the theology of God, what God, that God is love and he gives sacrificially and unconditionally. It's given freely. It says so much about a person's heart and character to be able to give honor to others that perhaps don't even deserve it, want it, or even appreciate it, but it's done anyway because of their own relationship with God. It's so powerful. In Luke 14, we're also to give honor to, to those who are not part of our church, to those who are non-Christians. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So if even non-Christians we are to honor. So think about your friends and family. Honor them. Amen. And so today we looked at why we honor others. We looked at who do we honor. Now, when do we honor? All the time. Be the first now. Do it now. Love others well. In verse 10, it says, live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers. Be first to honor others by putting them first. When do we honor each other? Now. Be the first to do it. Amen. Try it in your D groups tonight. I hope you will spend some time in your D groups honoring one another because I think we need it right now. As we are in our eighth month of COVID, as mental health challenges are rising right now, uh, you know, take some time in your group to honor one another. So here's a couple of things you could do in your discussion groups tonight. Is what, number one, what does honoring others say about our understanding of God? What does it say about our theology of God, our understanding of God when we can honor others? And secondly, who can you honor in your group tonight and why? I hope you spend some time honoring each other tonight. Remember, honor is given freely. They don't have to earn it. For you to give it respect, definitely, you know, people have to earn our respect, like earn respect by being respectable people. Absolutely. You know, but when we're talking about giving honor, you can give it freely because God gave it freely to us and honors us. And so what did we learn tonight is in our one another relationships, right? We're talking about honoring one another. Well, why do we honor one another? Well, because God honors us. Jesus honors us. The early church honored everyone especially those who were pushed to the margins. Uh, Who do we honor? Your parents, those who are older than you, governing authorities, elders, Christians, non-Christians. What's the practical today? Be the first to honor. When you go to your discussion groups tonight, be the first. Fight for who gets to go first to honor somebody else. Thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. I want to do some closing announcements. You can always connect with us 
uh, on our social media platform. There is an event coming up called We Are One Unity Talk. Uh, you can uh, contribute to the Covenant House. We have an event going on called Cove Love Caravan. Please talk to Augustus Charles and Chris Yen on that. Uh, you know, we want to, you can, you can be involved during the holiday season right now being give, being giving to, uh, youths that, that are homeless and, uh, you, you can, you can honor them. You can show honor. You can show love. You can show encouragement. Uh, in December 6th, we have a special service coming up called Frontliners. Uh, a salute to those who are first responders and frontliners. Uh, so that's going to be coming up in, in a couple weeks. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed midweek service tonight. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. Have a great night tonight. Good night. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.